want to say a very warm good morning to all of you who have already logged in. We know there are quite a number who are still logging in and we have actually given a few minutes uh, for that to happen. But uh, please feel free to join in as and when you can. We bring you greetings from the Federation of Kenya Employers. I am Jacqueline Mugo, the Chief Executive Officer of the Federation of Kenya Employers. This is our seventh webinar. And today we are looking at the topic of COVID-19 and safe return to work. We are now in the third month of dealing with COVID-19 pandemic, and we are still reeling from the shock of its devastating impact. The statistics indicate that the rates of infection are on the rise. And as at yesterday, 19th May, the figures of those tested stands at 46,784. The positive cases are 963. The active cases are 555. We mourn the loss of 50 Kenyans and uh, foreigners since COVID started and are very happy that 358 have recovered. So from these numbers, it is evident that we may not have reached the peak as yet as a country. From indications from the World Health Organization and the Ministry of Health, there is indication that coronavirus may be present with us for a long time. It may become endemic, just like other endemic illnesses or diseases like malaria. In this new scenario and possibility, then the key question is how should we adapt to this reality? On the other hand, the pressure is high from business and from our people who have no livelihoods, who have been staying at home and are now struggling to make ends meet. That is indicated from the outcome of many surveys which have been done since COVID-19 started. And as late as yesterday, the survey results which were released on the socioeconomic impact of COVID-19 on households. So for sure, Kenyans are suffering and the business uh, element, the capacity to put bread on the table is stretched and very difficult. We know from recent indications that discussions are underway on how we can gradually lift the current restrictions in the country, which will eventually lead to the reopening of business. But because of the rise in infections and the state of the country, we have had to extend twice the deadlines that have been given and the restrictions that have been given by the, the government. Decisions have been made to extend that and we are in the phase where that is continuing until the 6th of June. So this is an important conversation which we are having today. What factors should we take into consideration? What will constitute for Kenya a safe return to work during COVID-19? Because COVID-19 will not have gone away whenever it is we are able to go back to work. We have also discussed in this platform how COVID 19 pandemic has impacted the world of work and the workplace and the fact that the changes that we are seeing may last for a very long time so that very uh, aspect of returning to work is in itself uh, a change and a scenario that we'll have to adjust to we have a number of countries that have been dealing with this pandemic for a long time in the developed world who are now in the process of recovery they've managed to flatten the curve and actually resuming work and we can learn from them and i'm sure those discussions will come up uh, in our interaction this morning so to lead us in this conversation i am very pleased that we have highly experienced professionals who will lead us uh, on this topic and the key question we are discussing is what then will constitute timely and safe return when will it, will it not be too late or too early to resume work and what considerations from their perspective should we take? So our panelists will share their insights as practitioners and as people who've also been grappling with this issue in various perspectives. And I'm very pleased and honored to introduce our panelists to you today. The first one is Kwame Owino. Good morning, Kwame. He is the Chief Executive Officer of the Institute of Economic Affairs, IEA Kenya. He is an economist by profession and a think tank 
and has carried out research and uh, public dialogue on public affairs affecting Kenya and the region. He's previously worked as a program officer, basically um, taking charge of research and policy dialogue on various issues, largely touching on economic issues, on employment issues, on energy education, and regional uh, integration. So Kwame, we're very happy to have you with us this morning uh, for you to share your perspectives. The second panelist is Dr. Elizabeth Wala, who is a program director, health system strengthening at AMREF Health Africa here in Kenya. She also has various other roles as vice chair of the Kenya Health Care Federation. Um, she's, she's also involved in work at the SDGs Forum and a board member at KEPSA. With over 15 years experience in the fields of health, particularly focusing on universal health coverage, healthcare, and pharmaceutical medicine and clinical research, has participated in many meetings at global level and also here within the country and serves on very many forums in the same field. She is a doctor by profession with a certification and experience and qualifications uh, and a master of science in infectious disease, diseases from the University of London, among her many other qualifications. Karibu sana, Dr. Wala, to this webinar. Our third panelist is one that we know very well here at the Federation of Kenya Employers, Michael Macharia, or Mike Macharia as we call him. He is the Chief Executive Officer, Kenya Association of Hotel Keepers and Caterers. He's also a board member of the Federation in that capacity and serves on various other boards in the country. He is a representative at KEPSA, also serves on the Kenya Tour Tourism Federation, the National Labor Board, the National Tourism Crisis Response Team. With over 30 years experience working in top hospitality brands such as Hilton International, Sarova Hotels and Windsor, where he, he rose through various capacities to become the general manager. Mike is someone who has specialization in hospitality management, uh, where he has a BSc and also in marketing, in which he has a diploma. And currently, Mike is venturing into the field of law. I wish you well, Mike, in that aspiration. So these are eminent uh, gentlemen and a lady, and we want to welcome them. And I start off by giving them the floor really to share from their perspective and their view, what, where are we as a country as we speak today? And I'll give the floor first to Kwame. From your view as an economist and in terms of uh, the topic we're discussing today, how does Kenya compare with other countries, especially the developing economies who have uh, made a decision to reopen? Where are we today and what has been your experience? And uh, Kwame, the, the floor is yours. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Thanks for the kind introduction and thanks to your audience as well. Um, so I think to start with, let's remember that um, at the beginning of the year, um, um, there were forecasts about what would happen to Kenya's economy. And the, the, the very sensible forecast had it that Kenya would grow at about last year, the growth rate was about 5.8. So there was expectation that it would grow at 6%, which would be extremely impressive. Um, but of course, towards uh, February, with the locust invasion on one side, um, I think um, there was an anticipation about rains, but the rains came anyway. Um, there was a thinking that maybe uh, we might have to moderate those uh, expectations. So the one thing that was not seen at all was the question about COVID um, or SARS, which leads to the disease. Now, I think towards the end of March, of course, it became clear. I mean, towards uh, the beginning of March, it became clear that the risks and government began to prepare some um, basic protocols. So if you came at the airports, there were some checks and all, all this and all that. But nobody thought about what swing it would have towards economic growth generally, because I'll start with growth and what its effect is on employment and the rest of the economy. Um, so I think based on all these factors, East Africa and Kenya within East Africa was doing, was expected to do very, very well with the exception of those other risks that I've mentioned. But then SARS comes. And remember, it's a, it's, a, it's a health emergency, which then leads 
to the necessity of actually closing down farms because obviously when it first came and the news that came from Europe and, and China was that it's extremely virulent and very lethal. So what government made the decision, the first decision that government made um, was to close schools and I think that's important and obviously the correct decision in my view. Uh, I, I think it's unimpeachable because we have 16 million children going to school from early childhood education all the way to high school. That's 16 million, one third of, our, of, of the country. They often sit in very close proximity to each other, so the possibility of mass infection was real. And I think that decision is completely acceptable, uh, even uh, a sensible one. Uh, so the first thing was then over time, as government began to, to do some more screening and to check, um, of course, there's a report of the first person. And at the beginning, obviously, people thought that the spread was going to be very, very quick. And the advice the government gave to businesses, obviously, was to close, or at least to try as much as is possible to, to reduce interactions. So in reducing interactions through physical distancing, what it does is that it cuts possibility that businesses would continue uh, to do their work. Now, at the end of March, when the assessments were made by the uh, globally, International Monetary Fund actually had cut Kenya's growth forecast to about uh, 2%. Uh, the central bank had cut it to 3%. And then obviously right now the consensus forecast for the central bank release to last week was about 2.3, which would not be bad, but would just keep us barely at the point where growth rates are taking, I mean, are going above, growth rates are going above um, um, population growth rates. But the first thing that happened is that we have a bifurcated sector for, 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 for employment. So we have those who work in the modern sector, what we call the formal sector, and those who work in the informal sector. So the necessity of keeping people away from working in big gatherings, which is markets, of course, public transport and all those, and the decisions that government made meant necessarily that some people stay at home. I think it was advised for health purposes for people to stay at home. Schools are not going down. So its effects on businesses, retail businesses and all that obviously became clear. Its effect on transport as well became clear. And these are big sectors of Kenya's economy. So obviously there's a slowdown. Uh, and as we continue to receive news every day by government about what the infections have gone, sometimes we fear, some other times not. Um, but on the whole, I think the decisions that were taken, of course, not all of them went well, but on the whole, I think they've, hel they've helped to hold um, the spread beyond what it could have been and would have led to a disaster. So far, we seem to have, with the exception of what the economic effect is, um, I think the health burdens, of course, 50 people dying is not good. Uh, but um, given where we are now, compared to where we are in the beginning of March, many people think that, okay, it's a far better outcome than we could have had, or well, that, that was anticipated. Then comes the decision about, so if you have a growth rate expected to be six, and now we are dealing with 2.1, 2.3, um, and only assuming that we open soon so that there's a quick recovery, I think what we should concentrate on is that quick recovery is necessary. So we have a second quarter, which is part of the first quarter the last month, which is March and April are like lost because few businesses did any work. Um, we are hoping that we can go back quickly and I can see the anxiety among business people, including I and my colleagues for people to come back to work. But I'm not too sure <laughs> whether uh, we can make a call one way or the other, uh, whether it's a good decision right now to be open. For two reasons, one is government, the first thing is that this is a lethal disease, that there's no doubt. We are lucky because of our demographic profile in the sense that most of those who get unwell um, tend to be older people and it's a smaller share of our population overall. But still the risk is real for all population um, uh, ages in terms of transmission and infection. So what I'm not too sure is government has capacity, or rather Kenya has capacity for about 40,000 tests per day. And the only way you catch and flatten the curve is if you conduct tests so that you can tell which pockets are spreading it so that that can be maintained medically. So there's a clinical decision to be made. But you cannot make that clinical decision without understanding what the degree of spread is. And I'm not too sure that having conducted only 45,000, less than 50,000 tests over 60 days, that we actually have a good grasp of where the illness has spread or whether actually it's on the subterranean level or whether it's spreading more evil. Because what we know now is that we have some deaths, unfortunate. We have about 50,000 tests that have been carried out, but you're not too sure to what extent. There's what medics call hard immunity or to what extent it has actually spread and what has been controlled. So that makes it difficult 
for me to actually decide one way or the other whether it would be. And I know people are roaring to go back, obviously, because businesses have been kept down, transport has not been shut, all that. Uh, but it's not clear to us at the Institute of Economic Affairs that based on the numbers that have been published alone, that it's safe to actually call for everything to be done. So maybe what needs to be done will be some kind of phased in. I think in other parts of the world, we saw it in Korea, in Japan as well, when they seemed to be getting a dip, one of the things that happened is that as soon as they opened back, they saw cases going back up. And that's a real, real danger. So that's, that's what my real fear would be. So what should government do as I come towards the end? I think one of the things that government should do and business people can help with this is actually to, to, to urge government to scale up the testing. And we need to scale up, scale up the testing by a huge margin, basically to actually not only do that, do us 10 times as much tests as we do every day and continue that for as long as is necessary. Because nobody's sure the best case scenario would be if a vaccine came, but even if a vaccine came, it would not necessarily be available to everybody. Uh, so the first thing we need to do is to scale up testing. Scale up testing allows government to make the right decisions and business people to also make the right decisions about whether it's safe enough to open. So businesses that have more people working in close proximity would definitely decide to make other, other views. I am thinking that given the way that this virus spreads, or at least how it has shown, places where people meet in huge congregations where interactions are closed, so that social places, those, those should stay closed for the time being. If we have businesses where um, uh, individual business people can actually ensure that your staff are tested and if your staff can be tested and then at the same time have some safety regulations in place then that could be advised to be tested and go then government simply observes over time. I mean so coming back to this question yes we've seen opening in other parts of the world um, but if you haven't had a good grasp in terms of the data and the epidemiological testing to know where we are on that curve because what you're doing is flattening the curve if we don't know how pervasively distributed uh, the illness is, then it might be a bit unsafe to open at this time. So really, it's like a coin toss. Thank you. Thank you, Kwame. Very pertinent issues you raised there. Things could have been worse than they are, but we are not in a position where we can say, and you being the economist would be best place to help us here, we don't have the statistics to be able to make an informed decision. So the key issue is enhancing the capacity to test so that we have a good enough number to help us determine that. So it's not clear at present whether it's safe for us to, to return to work. And the indicators on Kenya's economic growth, very sharp decline, things are not good, but resuming work when prematurely, could in itself lead to a second wave. So that those are some of the key messages I had you saying, but certainly the decision to close, you used the word that I like very much by the government is unimpeachable. Before I invite uh, Mike to share his perspective, I want to invite all of you to kindly key in any questions you may have in the chat box, and we'll be able to pick them up later. So Mike, in terms of your opening remarks and sharing uh, where we are now from your perspective as someone operating in the business world, where are we in terms of business? How is business faring? What are the level of operations uh, that you see uh, happening? And what is business doing to cope? Has the decision by the government for gradual partial reopening of the hospitality industry where people meet certain uh, prescriptions and requirements helped are they managing to to reopen and um, what needs to be done to ensure that many of those enterprises in the hospitality industry are, are able to open so mike uh, please share your ideas Thank you, Jackie. Uh, it's good to be here. Uh, I think I'll share something on the screen uh, so that we can see exactly where we are. Uh, if if uh, people can be able to see that. Uh, just let me start this. I just have a few slides here, so bear with me. Uh, thank you for inviting me uh, here this morning. It's good to be at FKE offices. Uh, we are all used to working from home. Uh, so it's a, it's a welcome break. At least you get some fresh air as you, as you 
uh, make your way here. Now, uh, where we are, uh, as you asked, Jackie, uh, I think uh, Kwame mentioned this. We are, we are faced with a public health situation that has led to an economic meltdown. Uh, in our view, it's, it's a complete meltdown. Uh, in certain sectors, uh, as you will see later, uh, there has uh, arisen various uh, new opportunities, and uh, particularly in the manufacturing sector, where we've seen uh, a lot of innovation. Uh, our, our people manufacturing PPEs, uh, students coming up with uh, ventilators. Uh, we have seen uh, uh, apps being developed and so on and so forth. But in the tourism and hospitality industry, this is mainly a very much people-to-people -people, uh, industry. And uh, we were actually the first to shut down. And, and we started shutting down even before uh, the announcement was made, uh, I think, on the, on the 14th of March. Uh, because as uh, late as February, we were already experiencing cancellations from our source markets. And we could see uh, the trend and, and where it was going. So all airlines, hotels, uh, agencies, operators, uh, restaurants, uh, entertainment spots, uh, they all shut down after that announcement uh, by government. Now, uh, what we had estimated at that point, uh, mid-March, is that if this goes on till June, uh, we could lose about uh, uh, 50 billion shillings uh, in revenue and, uh, and put uh, at risk over 3 million uh, jobs. Uh, there's been a lot of debate in the in the media and on social media about exactly how many jobs exist uh, in the industry. Uh, I saw at one point uh, the, the, the Central Bureau of Statistics, uh, KNBC, uh, stating that there were 80,000 jobs. Uh, our count uh, for hotel industry alone, a physical count that we've conducted, uh, lands us at just about 750,000. So I would like to imagine that uh, uh, KNBS probably missed a zero uh, and meant uh, 800,000 in the industry. Uh, we've got uh, two operators uh, who account for another million, 0.5 or so jobs. We've got uh, pubs and restaurants and ent entertainment areas. Uh, we counted about another 1.3 million jobs there. Uh, if you just go to the licensing department of, uh, of the Nairobi City County, uh, you will find that there are 10,000 uh, pubs and restaurants uh, licensed. In Kisumu, it's about 8,000. Uh, Mombasa, we are talking about uh, seven or 8,000. So this, these are numbers that uh, we've actually uh, researched ourselves as an association, and, and uh, we uh, give them out very authoritatively. Uh, in terms of uh, the social situation, there's a steady decline. I think uh, Kwame mentioned about... Uh, uh, or some, I, I saw something in the chat about mental health issues. Uh, there's, uh, there's stress, there's uh, the likelihood of, uh, of a spike in crime because of lack of money and so on and so forth. So these are, this is typically where we are. Generally, as an industry, we are completely shut down. Uh, so what, what is our response? Uh, what we did uh, very early, uh, is that uh, we started advocating for stimulus packages from government. We actually asked for tax breaks, uh, uh, VAT, remissions. Uh, we asked for an adjustment of uh, banking policy to inject liquidity uh, into the businesses. Uh, but we realized at some point that uh, uh, liquidity was not really uh, the bigger issue. The bigger issue was uh, rescheduling of loans and, and uh, repayment of rents and so on and so forth. So what he did is that we went and uh, first committed uh, to keep our employees in, in jobs in the short run. And uh, we signed up a memorandum between uh, our union and, uh, and, and uh, their, their, their association. And we actually structured it in such a way that, uh, that people would first take leave immediately, uh, annual leave which was paid, then we'd go on rotations uh, of uh, unpaid leave uh, for two weeks uh, so that we could keep people employed and sort of like move the consumption from, from the workplace into their local places. So sort of like injecting uh, some, some money into the areas where they live. 
Uh, unfortunately, after that memorandum was signed, we had to completely shut down because uh, the airspace was shut down. Uh, you remember curfew was in, 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 imposed. Uh, Nairobi was shut down, Mombasa, Kilifi, and Kuala were shut down. Uh, so that meant even the jobs that we were trying to protect, uh, people had nowhere to go. So what happened is that uh, we were left with a bill uh, of 50%, and we were telling our members, uh, staff members, uh, stay home, we'll pay you 50% of your salary just to stay home. Uh, and, and obviously this meant that uh, some businesses would have to start borrowing money to keep that going. We were envisaging a situation whereby we would have uh, cleared the peak by June and hopefully be able to start coming back. So what we did is that we also persuaded our other industry players. As you know, tourism has very many subsectors within. We have, uh, we have hospitality, we have entertainment, we have uh, pubs, we have restaurants, we have two operators, travel agents, and we have uh, the airlines, the air operators. And, and uh, we realized that within most of the industry subsectors, uh, there is no existence of uh, collective bargain agreements. So what we did is that we made this deal and uh, we sat with the CES uh, Labor uh, together with FKE and KOTU and, and uh, we persuaded all the other subsectors to adopt this as much as they can and where they can. And we also tried to uh, push them uh, into uh, tripartism so that they can start uh, having CBAs uh, that would uh, mitigate uh, such circumstances. Obviously, we teamed up with other organizations, uh, FKA being one of them, KEPSA being another, uh, and, and we are constantly working out mitigation plans uh, on a daily basis. Are we ready to resume? That's, that's the key question. And this is, again, it's a delicate balance between public health and safety uh, versus economic impact. We've had some people telling us, uh, I'd rather take chances with the virus than sit at home and die of starvation. So you, you, you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. So how, how then do we approach this? Uh, the tourism industry is always the first. We are the, always, always the first to be hit. And, uh, and more often than not, the last to recover. So we, we, are, we are saying, how do we get ready for this uh, new normal? How do we get ready for this new normal? I think uh, Kwame spoke about testing. Uh, testing is important. Uh, it, it gives you an indication of, uh, of where you are in terms of, of infection and, and how then to keep people safe. Uh, but it's also a tall order to, to get the entire population tested. So it, it's something that we must think about. What, what are the thresholds of this uh, test that we are talking about? Uh, on our side, we need to revamp our products. Uh, hospitality products uh, will never be the same. Uh, you know that uh, we are almost always used to having a full uh, aircraft Hotels are full, swimming pools are full, gymnasiums are full, uh, uh, pubs are full, restaurants are full. So what will happen is that uh, you, you find that we will, even if we do open up tomorrow, we, because of the rules of social distancing and, 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 and the lack of the social uh, aspect of, uh, of uh, tourism, then we'll, we'll find ourselves in a situation whereby we have to lose a lot of uh, our customers to keep the space. So for example, if a, a typical restaurant that had a capacity of 100 people will find itself not able to serve more than 20. Now, that's a big challenge in itself because some of these uh, investment decisions are made based on, on the uh, projections in numbers. So some people will come back to us and tell us, hey, uh, my numbers just don't work. For, for this space, uh, the kind of rent I'm paying, the, the amount of staff I'm employing, uh, the utility bills and, uh, and, and other input costs uh, just do not justify uh, uh, an investment of this nature at 30% uh, capacity. So we'll have this problem. So we'll have to revamp our products. We'll probably start thinking uh, innovatively how do we get our products out there 
uh, how do you present a nice meal in a takeaway uh, in a takeaway package as you would in a restaurant our attitudes will have to change uh, our behavior will have to change uh, the, the social aspect uh, will have to to sort of like uh, decline in a way and 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 find itself uh, in, in in a new frontier we have to invest a lot in health and safety which at the moment is extremely extremely uh, expensive a single test for a single person is uh, between 5000 and, and, and 13000 shillings so if you have uh, a thousand staff members and you have to test them every two weeks you're spending millions and millions of shillings uh, in 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 an area that uh, you are probably not seeing uh, any solid returns so what are the risks as as we try to open uh, Kwame mentioned a new wave of infections. This is uh, this is real. It's very very real. The way I mean, uh, uh, looking at other destinations in the world, and in places like uh, hospitality places, you know, if you you you're seated in a pub uh, after a few drinks, you probably become uh, you know uh, happier and less uh, less careful. You might see people starting to exchange masks. Uh, we have not yet uh, uh, determined uh, the risk of transmission in a swimming pool, for example. Uh, we are told that this disease uh, is transmitted through droplets. So what happens if I'm in a swimming pool uh, and, and, uh, and there is water there, there is a mass of water and there are other people uh, in the same pool? We don't know. We don't have scientific information yet. So these are the things that we'll have to, to think about. There's obviously going to be a lot of psychological trauma for the employees who might not be able to get back to work. And, and even for the ones who get back, uh, having lost uh, some of their friends and colleagues, uh, they'll have to be some serious uh, uh, counseling support uh, that will need uh, to be done. There's also the stigma. Uh, if, if I appear at the workplace today uh, with a cough uh, or a sore throat, uh, everybody thinks I've got uh, COVID-19. So everybody wants to stay away from me. Uh, we need to sort out this stigma. And probably this is an area where, where the government uh, and, and all of us have to come in and, and give people more support as opposed to making them feel unwanted. Uh, we will see uh, an inability to reinvest uh, in the businesses due to these long periods of uh, of, of, a depressed, uh, of a depressed economy. Uh, we will have extremely discerning customers. Now, you can imagine if your customer is coming from Japan or, or from the United States, they want to be comfortable. They want to be given the comfort that the entire trip will be safe. So from the time they book their flight, from the time they, they land at the airport, who picks them up in what car? What safety measures do you have in, in, in the transport? What safety measures do you have uh, at, at the hotels? What safety measures at the restaurants, at the pubs, on safari? Uh, do animals transmit if, if, if I uh, encounter a pride of lions uh, or a couple of monkeys and a monkey coughs, is that something that I should be worried about? So you will find that there's a lot of uh, discernment from customers in, in the areas of health. And these are, these are areas that uh, we are not really experts at. Uh, we just take what we, 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 we hear from the scientists. There'll be a, a big scramble for, for a smaller pie. So we are probably going to see uh, depressed uh, uh, prices. Uh, in terms of uh, room accommodation rates, uh, park entry fees, and so on and so forth. As people now, uh, other destinations start to compete for the same small number of customers. Uh, and we might see in other areas uh, like the airlines uh, an increase in prices because they are losing a, a, a huge chunk of capacity. And that might also hold true for, for hotels and restaurants. So our reopening plans, uh, we are working very keenly with the Ministry of Health. Uh, we've developed very strong health and safety protocols. Uh, for hotels alone, we have a summary of about eight pages of what needs to be done right from uh, when you enter the premises, uh, the temperature checks, 
the, the uh, protective equipment, gloves, uh, sanitizers, uh, hand wash basins, uh, changing of linen on a daily basis, uh, disinfecting regularly, looking after staff buses, looking after the areas where people sit in, in pubs and restaurants, looking after where they, 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 the, the transport that will pick them from the airport. So within the hotels, uh, pubs and restaurants and, and the retail sector, which is restaurants and supermarkets. Uh, we have uh, jointly about uh, 20 or so pages of what we are calling standard operating procedures. And these are on top of what the government has given as protocols under the Ministry of Health. So we are trying to align ourselves with these protocols and, and give uh, uh, what we call SOPs. As you know, hotels, the tourism industry is, is, is uh, very much used to high levels of hygiene. So uh, compliance is not really a big issue. The, the, the only big issue is the cost of compliance, which we'll be talking about. Uh, we'll need to strengthen our partnership with the health authorities. In the old days, uh, and, 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 and I'm a bit being a bit cheeky here, the old days uh, being uh, pre-COVID, uh, so that's, that's uh, if anybody was born uh, in January of 2020, uh, then they might consider themselves old, given the, the experiences that they've had so far. We, we had uh, sort of like a, a, a regulator regulation relationship with uh, the health authorities, where you went and applied for your public health certificates at the beginning of the year. Every twice a year, you take your staff members for for what is known as uh, uh, food handler certificates, where uh, they, would, they would go through certain tests to make sure there is no uh, infection being passed on. So now we are seeing ourselves in more of a partnership with health. Uh, the same partnership that we cultivated with the Ministry of Tourism uh, and, and other areas like environment, we'll have now to strengthen that uh, with the health authority. Uh, we'll need to prioritize the domestic market because that's, that's a quick win. Uh, the size in itself might not be as, as, as large as uh, the total market, but it's a market that uh, is, is quite, quite important because remember, uh, Kenyans are also not traveling abroad. They are not traveling out there. So they, they need, we need to start looking at, at them consuming uh, uh, the, the market domestically. Then we move to the regional market and we are doing a lot of work with the, with the East African community. Uh, right now, we are trying to revive uh, the East African tourism platform that was responsible for bringing uh, Kenya, Uganda and Rwanda, uh, the single visa and the movement by ID. So we are trying to move that. We know that uh, we are still having a bit of challenges with uh, Tanzania and Burundi, but those we feel are just short lived. Uh, we'll have to revive our key source markets internationally. We've been told by our partners that Germany will be ready to open up uh, by mid-June. So the travel advisory uh, that has been imposed in Germany against international travel will be lifted. So we need to be ready for that. And we can identify places that they can go to. A good example is uh, a place like Masai Mara because of the nature of uh, the environment there. The lodges are smaller, so you can have fewer people in one place. You can be able to, to social distance because uh, the tents are usually very far apart. And you can also be able to go on safari without being too many. A place like Diani, for example, has not been flooded uh, for too many COVID cases. We could fly directly there as we wait for Mombasa and Kilifi to resolve. And, and we can start uh, pushing such destinations. And also Nairobi itself, uh, with, with our population of over 4 million here, we can start uh, traveling internally in Nairobi. Uh, we'll have to develop some incentives, waivers, uh, visa fees, land fees, uh, reduced uh, tour packages uh, to cater for the competition that I had uh, mentioned earlier. And then we need to have some new mitigation measures uh, within the industry. We'll need to have uh, training uh, in protocols uh, and health. Uh, that, that's very, very important. Uh, we need to communicate, uh, communicate and communicate because that's one of the, the areas that we are finding the communication that is going out there uh, either uh, is, is, is not treated uh, seriously or is uh, 
uh, or, or you find that the general public is in doubt of some of the communication that goes out there. And also in the areas of stigma, uh, we, we would need the government to start thinking about probably this issue of uh, quarantine. Uh, quarantine has been viewed as, uh, as a punishment before. So you, you find that uh, if I suspect that I have uh, COVID and I have uh, four children in my house uh, and a spouse, then I'm scared that we'll be separated and we'll be taken to other to different places. So you find that uh, people are not willing to come out because they think that already is uh, a jail sentence that might lead into a death sentence that, and you might never see your family again. So we need to find better ways of communicating uh, both at government level and at, uh, and at business level. Uh, this, we have to exploit technology. This has been said uh, so many times. We are now used, getting used to, to Zoom meetings without interrupting each other, uh, which is a good thing. Uh, we have to encourage uh, multi-skilling within our industry. We will need a lot of people trained uh, in health modules, uh, and this will become important. Uh, we'll need to develop a culture of savings, particularly in businesses, uh, for, for reserves, uh, so that you can mitigate in case of uh, such issues. And finally, we need to stay safe. Uh, I think I'll stop there, uh, Jackie. If I did not answer all your questions, then uh, I'll be happy to revisit. So thank you very much, and thank you, everybody, for listening. Thank you very much, Mike. I think that's been a, a very comprehensive uh, response and viewpoint. Most of the questions I asked you, I think you've addressed well, and we'll also have an opportunity to dig deeper into them when we open up to uh, the participants to ask questions. You've given us a very good viewpoint of where uh, we are now in terms of business. You've said that this is the tourism sector was the first to be hit and maybe and often is the last to recover. Clearly, a lot of work is happening behind the scenes to get the sector into a state of readiness to resume work. But the cost of that preparedness is high. The cost of compliance is high. There's a lot that needs to be done to ensure that when work resumes, we do not go into a second wave. Pretty much what uh, Kwame was also talking about, the risk of starting too early and without having the, the facts, the data, and the st statistics to inform that. It's also clear that you need innovation and that the impact in terms of confidence and trust on the part of your clients and, and customers. And this is true, I think, of the business community. That trust has been lost how will people be safe in terms of interaction and at the same time observe the the safety measures that we know we have to keep observing uh, social distancing wearing of masks and, and interact at the same time so that there are risks in it and uh, the issue is about timing and about um, getting the sector into to a level where they'll be ready but that again is driven by the health aspects which now uh, allows me to bring in Dr. Wala. Um, I'm sorry you're the lady and you're the last to speak, but that's because you bring in the health aspect and I'm hoping you have the right dosage for us this morning to help us address uh, a number of key issues. We had initially thought as a country when COVID-19 started that we'd sort of peak off around April, June. So from your perspective, where are we now? What are the indications from the numbers that we are seeing? We are far from that, far from picking off, far from flattening the curve. So this uh, possibility of uh, rushing into reopening and maybe exposing ourselves to a second wave, how serious is it? What are the risks that we face as a country and as enterprises? And how can we achieve this delicate balance that uh, both Mike and Kwame have talked about? because we have a health crisis for sure. It's a public health crisis endangering lives, but we also have a pressure of lively, livelihoods and people suffering. Mm -hmm. So is there a way of balancing these two? And how then can we assess when it is uh, we'll be ready to return safely to work? So over to you, Dr. Wala. Thank you very much, Jacqueline. Allow me to share a couple of slides. So good morning, everyone, uh, from wherever you're watching. 
Um, it's it's good I've gone last actually because um, my colleagues have have uh, mentioned a couple of things that I may not repeat. But one of the things that I need to bring out is that COVID-19 for us as a health sector is a new, it's a novel virus uh, in terms of uh, we've not experienced something of this nature. The last time there was a pandemic was uh, almost a century ago. Uh, number two, we are now in a global space, a global world. And as such, we have seen the impact of uh, the spread of the pandemic uh, using the various means. Uh, the other thing I'd like to mention is that um, the nature of managing this pandemic is through a lot of social measures, which for us, especially in an African setting, um, may be finding it very difficult. One, we are very social in nature. Two, we live in communities that are very close to each other. And uh, three, we do have quite a number of other social issues that are affecting us. For example, uh, most of us in Kenya, over 50% live in less than a dollar a day. So considering the economic impact of this uh, virus might uh, is very paramount in, in the way that we, we attack it. We are also looking at the regional response. Um, the countries in the East African region, uh, basically focusing on what have they done. And we are seeing Tanzania has taken a totally different route. And that means that um, we have also a lot of health diplomacy to, to work on in, in, in addition to the health measures that we are putting in. And then the, first, the last part is on that this virus is, there's so much unknown about it. So uh, it would be very important to appreciate that we have no experts in this. Um, so every time there's new information coming on board, uh, at one point we thought it's only uh, spread through human to human infection. Infection. Now we are looking at possibility of uh, some of the domestic animals also contracting it. Uh, we are looking at vaccine management. Uh, do we, if if you get infected at some point, do you get lifetime immunity? So like patient zero, is she free from um, future infections? So those are the things that we need to consider because they have an impact when you tell someone you uh, you are once infected, now you're negative. Um, does that guarantee people to does that guarantee people from future infections and then the last one is on the ethics in uh, line with uh, the fact that the virus is highly um, it's severe the infection is severe in uh, people with reduced immunity either the extreme of ages or people with other diseases and the natural the the in between population, which is what we have a lot, and I think uh, CS Mutahi Kagwe had uh, examples of the statistics he released yesterday that it's the young people who are exhibiting um, the infections, but then in terms of severity, it's the older people uh, or the ones who have issues that are um, are dying. So the, the, there's another cause of. Uh, 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 discussion that is looking at should we let the virus just go through its natural phase and that means quote unquote um, that some people will uh, succumb to it and then the others will generally get the immunity from spread to spread which is a principle that is discussed in the field of immunology so um, and then to also talk about the health sector that it's a double jeopardy for us one, because you now we are the center of uh, discussion, everyone is looking at us for direction. But secondly, because health sector is also a business. So we have uh, people already affected the same way the tourism industry is affected. We are having hospitals considering laying off staff because we have clinics that were previously running that have been closed down. We have people turning towards digital health. Uh, we have the NGO sector is very hard hit because now there's uh, social distancing and reduced movement. And that means that um, many of these cannot carry out the projects that they had uh, on that. So when I'm, speak when I'm speaking through this, I am looking at it on both sides from the fact that health sector is a business in itself and the other side where health sector is a technical sector that is offering guidance on this. Now, the slide that's shown on, um, on the screen right now is looking at our trajectory in line with the global scale. This is data as of 17th May. Uh, we need to update it to yesterday's data. But I need to give a word of caution that this is 
in respect to the number of tests. So the more you test people, the more you'll get cases. And Kenya um, has relatively very low testing cap capacity. And thus we should not rejoice that our numbers are low, but uh, we need to see it in line with the number of tests. And I think there'll be a slide going through that. Now, when you look at the East African region, um, you can see that uh, Kenya is the second, so Somalia is leading in terms of the cases, absolute numbers again, um, but the others are following suit. Uh, you can see Tanzania has a flat, and that doesn't mean that they don't have cases. It simply means that as a country, they are not uh, publicly declaring the number of test, uh, positive cases from their end. And this needs to worry us as a country because we've talked about uh, being a global village, and thus, if our neighbors are not putting into place measures, then uh, it's very hard for us to, you know, isolate ourselves into a cocoon that we don't. It's it's easy to block, say, the porous, uh, the borders where there is um, there is uh, um, checkpoints, but then we know our borders are very porous. So it's important that even as we are doing these measures, that there's need for regional coordination in terms of testing and contact tracing. And we've seen the trade industry between the two countries uh, suffering some stalemates that uh, we observed in the last couple of days. Now, in line with uh, when do we restart? So uh, for us, we look at it in two ways. One is the readiness of the in terms of the health sector. But the other one is what I think Kwame and um, and Mike have mentioned on the economic and social readiness. So I'll focus on the health readiness. And here we are looking at the disease progression, which is an indicator on whether our efforts that we've put into place are, are, are having an impact or not. So this has a lot to do with epidemiology, which is, which is a field of uh, study that looks at how um, uh, the disease progresses and the number of cases. And again, I want to have caution here that uh, our testing capacity is very limited. So we would love to, to test very many people, but uh, we are having some constraints in terms of the kits that are available and also the, the tools that are required in the laboratory. I think we've seen in the global supply chain that uh, quite a number of countries are holding on to supplies. One of the key ingredients in testing for us is a machine called PCR test that has uh, cartridges that are manufactured mostly by um, a company in the US and President Trump has categorically said he's not releasing those uh, cartridges to the other markets. And this is an, uh, has an impact. So there's a lot of health diplomacy, again, as I mentioned, that's required in this fight. The other thing to look at is our healthcare capacity. And uh, as a health sector, uh, at least I for one, I'm very happy in, in terms of now we have a very purposeful focus on strengthening our health systems. One, maybe because now our politicians do not have any option to fly out and get the healthcare that they used to get outside the country. And thus they are able to critically now see what the gaps are the, that we've been mentioning before. But secondly, also to understand um, the kind of innovations that have come out of the fact that every country is looking upon itself to 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 manage the pandemic and i see i think you've seen quite a lot of innovations coming out in line with with ventilators in line with masks in line with you know personal protective equipment and this is a plus which means that if we had the right political will uh, we had resources channeled towards the health sector that we are able to improve this system but as it is now our capacity, if we were to go to the level of um, many patients requiring ICU care, uh, we are not sufficient to manage that surge. So we are trying, I think we've mapped out the facilities that have um, ICUs, but not very many are able to isolate. So ha having a bed and the capacity to isolate someone because this is an infectious disease, is totally different. And we do have some facilities that have categorically said they are not going to take in patients who have COVID-19 because of the measures that are required to, to manage such, such patients. And then we look at the virus monitoring, which is uh, in, in line with the virus testing, contact tracing, tracking and isolation. Uh, countries that have done very well in this uh, include South, South Korea that uh, quickly 
put in place a digital tracking mechanism using uh, um, the mobile system and uh, they were able to link up you know, contra contracts of positive cases and manage that very early in the disease. So it's now when you're scaling up some of these innovations and um, it's very important and critical because one patient or one person who has who is positive is able to um, infect quite a number. I think we've seen the Mandera County and I think uh, Wajir, where you've had uh, the positive uh, patients traveling all the way from Kilifi by bus, stopping over in Nairobi, and then going towards uh, their home counties, and as such, leaving a trail of positive cases. But now when you go towards economic and social readiness, this is what now Kwame and Michael Doctor, you're vanishing. Are we prepared at work? Hello, is, is this better now? It's better now. The last two sentences uh, disappeared. Okay. So, sorry for that. I was talking about the economic and social readiness, which is an indicator of whether to restart an economy. Readiness, and this is where we are looking at new ways of working. In in social distances um, in life. And then the second one is looking at uh, our public response, which is a social, this is a social, social uh, disease. So when you tell people no social, do not get into contact, how do people who work in Jengos um, address such a thing? Or if you're talking about market responses, so we need to bring in social uh, anthropologists towards uh, better communication materials, you're putting people into quarantine spaces, denying them interaction. Then in terms of government preparedness is also an angle, which is looking at what are the policies, the frameworks that are that are, need to be in place, so incentives to do business, reviving economies, and things like that. So I will not delve on that because that's not my field of practice. And I think I want to skip this one and go to uh, this, this slide that's looking at the cases and where they've been identified. And as I mentioned, if you look at the second map, that we have uh, focus uh, uh, for uh, cases in the northern part. And as I say, this is because someone traveled all the way from Kilifi to that space. So what has happened is that um, the government has started putting in pleasures of uh, isolated lockdown measures. So we've seen in Nairobi, uh, Isili County has been put under lockdown measure, and that's coming out from the tests that have turned positive from the population in that space. But again, uh, we are also cautious on that because uh, if you went and publicly tested a group of people and you don't compare it with another group, then it is uh, epidemiologically or statistically, we can't say that that particular group has higher cases because you've not tested another comparative group. But as long as you're showing that there are quite a number of tests, uh, positive cases coming from a certain country, then there are certain measures that need to be in place. Now, I'll just give this brief of a case study of South Africa that has an alert system that maybe we could borrow. And this is a slide that we've shared also with the Ministry of Health, looking at different levels. For example, if they're at level five, which is to my extreme left, this is where you look at the state of the epidemic and then the businesses, um, activities that are allowed and the restriction of movement. So for example, we, we are in a high virus spread uh, space and maybe if we are in a low readiness. Low readiness here, again, I mentioned there's a health readiness and there's a business readiness. So here in this case, we just have essential services only that are allowed to operate. And uh, we are supposed to implement uh, stay at home orders and uh, restriction of movement excluding cargo. So in Kenya, this is basically where we are at now. But if we go towards uh, flattening the curve and improving our readiness in terms of our capacity to handle the disease, then you are able to open a couple of uh, businesses that, for example, agriculture, mining, uh, we don't, uh, forestry and uh, other professional services that really don't have a lot of face-to-face -face interactions. Um, they are looking at moving towards level three, which is where there's moderate virus spread, 
and moderate readiness. Then you are looking at uh, other industries. So progressively, as you go, maybe hopefully towards level one, where there's low virus spread, and the health system is very ready to handle any cases that might come up, then you're able to open a few of these things that I think we are looking at. So in Kenya, I see as uh, opening these uh, businesses, so your restaurants, um, we've not yet, and hotels, of course, didn't close really, but we are, when you look at our status of epidemic, we are actually on level five. So we are cautioning, I think, uh, the government and of course businesses that let's not rush towards opening because we are not ready in terms of uh, our health system and we are not ready in terms of our testing. And then we are hopefully going towards uh, normality, but uh, we highly doubt that this is, uh, virus is here to stay with us and it's more or less managing uh, the conditions as they come. So um, I needed to just mention in terms of testing that um, our capacity to test. So in Germany, what they've done is they're looking at uh, if they see over one case, over 20 tests done and only one case is positive, then they will look at um, reopening the foundation. So they have set for themselves that. Now in Kenya, it's very hard to do that because our capacity to test, again, I will repeat, compared to say Rwanda. Rwanda is testing five times more than we are doing. South Africa is testing 10 times more than we are doing. So until we get to that space where we are testing as many people as we can, we start with the high risk populations who are the health workers. Now we've seen truck drivers are falling there. Uh, we've gone to restaurants. Um, we need to be very cautious because we do not want to get back to a situation where we thought we were managing the disease, but then uh, we get an upsurge. And at this time, in this point in time, we are not clear about how the virus behaves. So yes, maybe our mortality or death rates are not as high as had been modeled before, but we cannot predict how tomorrow will go. So with that, I'd like to end, and I want to appreciate BCG, Boston Consulting Group, for the slides that they shared with us. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Walla. Some very sobering uh, thoughts there, and also information bringing a bit of clarity to my fuzzy mind on this issue about uh, opening up because you brought in health diplomacy that's a new one for me and we do have health diplomacy issues uh, clearly from what we see even happening with our neighbors i'm going to open up the floor to questions from participants but if none of them asks you this question dr wala i hope you'll answer it how come rwanda and south africa are able to test more than we are and how is it that um, we are not able to scale up? Because I think the last indications have been that we can test about 2,000, but from what I heard earlier, we can actually do more than that. Uh, okay, Trump is not sharing his kids, but why haven't we asked, uh, I think it's Senegal that has such testing kits. These are things we are reading. So what is the problem? But what I also hear from you, we are at level five. So we really should be looking at essential services and opening up on only those ones and staying with the current restrictions. So those are interesting thoughts. But let me now bring in my colleague Moses Ombok, who's been tracking the questions that have been coming in from the participants. And I will give him freedom to decide which of the panelists to direct his question to. Moses is in charge of uh, labor relations here at FKE as a senior officer. So for Mike, Kwame, and Daktari, uh, Moses will share with you the questions. Moses? Thank you, Edi. I'm happy uh, to share the questions. And I would like to begin with uh, Mr. Mike Masharia, the CEO of the Hotel Keepers. The first question comes from one Peter Kabir. And uh, Peter Kabir is asking, 
are there a set of set testing centers for hospitality industry staff? Can these centers be put in public domain for ease of identification? Are there virtual payment platforms that can ease the payment of testing fee requirement? And what are the factors to consider safe back to work for employee, employees at this time of COVID-19 pandemic? What are the risks? What are the measures for the employees? And lastly, is there any consideration to include hospital insurance cover, NHIF for employees in case of contracting COVID-19 while in the line of duty? Over to you, Mike. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mbok. Those are, those are very many questions from one person. I think uh, <laughs> uh, Peter, Peter is, uh, is, is generally as concerned as uh, any other person, and, and uh, we share your concerns. Now, are there testing centers? Yes, there are. Uh, what we are doing with the Ministry of uh, Tourism, together with the, sorry, the Ministry of Tourism, Ministry of Health, and uh, the Nairobi Metropolitan uh, service for now is we have identified one test, testing center uh, but we know that we have very many people who need to take these tests and uh, there is a danger of announcing that center then having everybody crowd there in this era of social distancing. Uh, I think uh, the first time people got wind of uh, that center uh, on the first day, I think it was on Monday, we had 500 people there. We had to stop it. So what we've done is that we've asked our hotels, our restaurants, and our retail outlets to offer their premises. So say, for example, uh, a hotel uh, operating in the Hallingham area that has capacity to take uh, and, and social distance uh, uh, people, we could identify areas. Uh, probably, uh, because most of hotels have clinics anyway, we could have a waiting at the clinic, we could have a waiting area at the garden and a waiting area at the swimming pool, for example. And the Nairobi Metropolitan Service and the Ministry of Health have agreed to be sending mobile testing centers to us. So once we've sorted out these testing centers, we shall announce and we can, we can take batches of about uh, uh, probably 100, but the, the testing capacity that uh, we've been uh, informed is available uh, is they can do 500 a day. So it's mainly up to us to identify the centers and identify the safety measures within those centers because it's not just about walking in and out. We would have also to get in there, disinfect uh, before the tests, disinfect after, and, and it, it requires a lot more. So we are thinking by about next week, we should be having some centers that will we will announce. Yes, there is virtual payment. There's a payment platform at uh, Bagadi Hospital, uh, an MPESA number that we will share once these test centers are available. Uh, and you will just be paying uh, through MPESA, give your name, details, and everything. You pay through MPESA, then you're put on a queue and you're told when to come for the test. So that's already been uh, uh, thought about. The factors to consider uh, on safe return, uh, these are contained in the, in the standard operating procedures that we have as uh, hotels, as pubs and restaurants, as uh, retailers. We have developed those. And uh, if you would like to see those, uh, unfortunately, we haven't published them for the public, but uh, we've shared them with a good number of our members. If you're interested, uh, just share your email address and I'll send you something on the inbox so that you can, you can see. And this covers also uh, the risks and measures that, uh, that uh, we should take place uh, to protect uh, employees. Uh, we, we have a duty to protect employees. We have a duty to protect our clients. We have a duty to protect anybody else who might be uh, walking in and out of the premises, whether it's a supplier bringing uh, supplies, whether it's somebody who has come to pick up their, their payment uh, check. So we, we have a lot of uh, uh, what, what, what is known as uh, uh, 
in the medical world as a duty of care uh, in, in, in our area is actually very, very heightened. Now, about insurance, we, as FKE, uh, now I'll speak on behalf of FKE because I'm also a board member of FKE. As FKE, we have already started engagements with the, with the insurance sector. We actually, our first meeting was with the Cabinet Secretary of Labor. Uh, and we, our, our message was we need to get NHIF uh, to cover uh, COVID-19. We've gone to the insurance uh, companies uh, because there's a lot of people who have insurance and we've asked them, can you cover uh, COVID-19? And the feedback we got uh, as uh, late as yesterday was that the insurers are actually now engaging with because the insurer, insurance companies also need to be reinsured. So they're actually engaging the, the reinsuring companies to make sure that COVID-19 is covered. And hopefully in a week or two, we should have that. But it would be a good thing, even if it's uh, an enhancement of the cover, uh, but it's a good thing that, uh, that COVID should also be treated just like any other disease when you, when you go to hospital. I hope I have answered everything, Peter. Uh, thank you, Mike. I'm uh, equally happy. Uh, Mr. Peter Kabiri should be happy wherever I am. Now, uh, the next question goes to uh, Mr. Kwame Owina. And uh, it's coming from Jeremiah Joma of Jesus Assembly Church. And the question goes, I'm sorry, COVID-19 is a pandemic. It's a disease which is not going today. How is the guideline advice on how to go about it as the churches open and schools? We have seen hotels, bars open in our country and some countries. Churches and schools are opening up. Then the question ends, uh, Mr. Kwame, we have hotels opening. Is this a good practice? Uh, over to you, Mr. Kwame. Um, okay, uh, thanks, Jeremiah. Um, as, as, as I said, I mean, that's, a, that's a, a difficult question for me to answer, but let's, let's, let's if you understand how uh, the virus, SARS coronavirus 2, which is a cause, which is the pathogen that causes uh, COVID 19 disease, I mean, yes, the disease, uh, then it can guide us about whether, I mean, one way to answer your question. One, it appears that this disease, or at least what has been documented in the medical journals, is that this disease spreads easily in some kind of social settings. Settings where you have a large number of people densely uh, interacting with each other. So things such as parties, things such as uh, uh, stadiums, congregations, whether church or other congregations would be one. Because that is known, uh, and that's, that's a particularly potent way of passing it, I am not sure that it would be right for government at this moment, based on the number of tests that we have, to actually accept us. Because as you can see, especially religious gatherings, whether in Malaysia and other parts of the world have been shown as one of the ways in which this goes on. Why? Because of the nature of interactions that take place in places of worship. So while I'm one person who supports that, uh, I am not clear that with the data we have, and my suggestion is that the data we have in Kenya tells us that we don't know how pervasive the infections have been in the society. It would be extremely dangerous to open churches for regular worship. Now, maybe there's some kind of thing that can be done about spacing and all that, and they'd have to be more careful about how they do the, uh, the, the uh, I mean, uh, ensure that every worshiper has sanitation, I mean, does their sanitation, um, uses sanitizer and does keeps to all the social distancing. But that's one. Two, thinking about schools, and remember that many schools in this country have two types. There are schools where kids go in on a day-to-day -day basis, and of course, there are the residential schools. Each of them has peculiar risks. So in residential schools, obviously, as you've seen, and some of the TVs, have, I mean, we've, we've seen a screen uh, on, on, on TV where kids are piled up on top of each other in a uh, double-decker, they share ablutions, they share, even if they sit in classes and anything, to be extremely dangerous. Now, I understand the anxiety of all parents, 
have nieces and nephews as well. I understand the anxiety of all parents that's keeping kids at home, they might be losing and all that and everything else. I'm not too sure, to be honest, we're overstating what the losses would be. Uh, but the possibility that 16 million children walking into schools, 60% of them walking back home and interacting with their parents and other kids around the, um, around, um, the residential areas is extremely dangerous. So unless we have a good grasp of what it would take, uh, how pervasive this has been, my thinking is that it's premature. Uh, I know what it means. I mean, people have kids who need to sit exams at the beginning of this year and to go to college and everything else. Uh, but I think the risks that we could be taking absent the proper information about how pervasive this is, in my view, is, is too far. So talking about schools and, um, and, 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 and places of worship, and clubs as well, which people like to go to. They're efficient places for spreading the virus. So two people having it could spread it very effectively within the two hours of worship or one hour of worship. Now remember, if kids have to interact with all different actors in class over an eight or seven hour period, those are extremely important grounds for, for sending it around. If you think about it on the other side, that's, that, that uh, the capacity of the health system and the population risk on one, on, on one side, if you put all those factors together, it suggests to me that unless we can scale up, scale up both health capacity, systems capacity, and the ability to test, uh, I'm not too sure that that's a good call to make at this point. So yes, I understand the loss for kids, uh, and I'm anxious as well that people should go back to work, but schools and places of worship uh, at this moment, uh, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a decision that we're very cautious about. Yeah. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Kwame for uh, uh, your response to Jeremiah's question. At uh, this point, I would want to move to Dr. Wala. And uh, the question that I would be posing to Dr. Wala come from Monica Osoti in the education mm -hmm. sector. Uh, they are more of concerns and questions alike. Uh, this is high school's teacher and uh, this is what Monica is saying. Uh, my issues are transport to and from schools, population and space per class, social distancing, teacher student contact space, one meter apart and social distancing, unless personal protective equipment is there for less or no consultation, dining halls, masks feeding, population, space, and time allocation. Dormitory, masks, population, space, sleeping with hygiene, water availability and reliability, sicknesses, testing and medication, assembly, population and space. And then lastly, uh, mental health, all stakeholders, students, parents, teachers, and support staff. Uh, what, what is your take on this, uh, Dr. Thank you very much, Moses, and for that comment and question. So, yeah, the school issue is coming up right now. I think, I hope you are aware that there is a task force that was put together by the Ministry of Education and they're collecting views from the public on um, the, the steps to be taken when uh, reopening of schools. So from, please plug into that because I know as Kenyans, we are very good in giving feedback on social platforms and not um, the, the channels that we can use. Um, for us as, as a health sector, there's a team that's also looking at that, especially the team that is uh, involved in Infectious Diseases Society of, of Kenya. Um, the good thing, maybe let me not say the good thing. The positive side of this infection is that children are hardly affected in terms of um, the severity of the disease, but they do pose as carriers of the disease. So you might find uh, your child may not really go through the symptoms that uh, adults go through but then they pause the fact that they can bring the disease from a school environment into the household. So it is important to take note of that. The other thing is uh, some of these uh, public measures, for example, mask wearing, 
for children, it's very hard to reinforce because even you as an adult, I'm sure you're finding uh, wearing of masks quite a, a, a task. And uh, we've seen even our leaders on TV, you know, putting down their masks. Um, so we need to look for ways in which we are able to encourage uh, hand washing, um, sanitizing the hands, and uh, maybe keeping the social spaces. Uh, but then we also need to look at the practicality of some of this. As I said, let COVID-19 be a source of turnaround uh, for our country in terms of many of these social determinants of health that uh, we have struggled with all along. So if you look at a school that typically takes in, say, 50 students, 60 students in a class, it's very hard for you to start telling them without uh, supporting the resource, the infrastructure towards spacing of this. Uh, we are also looking at um, teachers uh, because these are now adults who are uh, at risk and also can pose as a source of infection. So do they teach wearing masks? What is the implication of this on the um, perception of the students, especially the very young ones? So we we are in a culture that needs to see someone face to face. Uh, we have seen uh, blended learning in terms of uh, digital platforms that are being used to teach students. What's the quality of the education? Should we adopt some of these classes to be online? Do we have the infrastructure? So I don't think I have a right or wrong answer for that. It is more that the discussion is happening right now. It's important for us to feed in one, as stakeholders, because uh, many of us are parents, but two, as uh, in, in, in line with the public health measures that we generally need to, to see. When it comes to mental health, this is very important. Mental health, not only in schools, mental health in uh, workplaces, this new way of working has, is a potential trigger source for, for mental health episodes. Um, for some of us who are extroverts, uh, we are finding it very difficult staying contained in, in a house during the lockdown. For others, it's just uh, keep being put uh, apart from you know, uh, the relatives and interactions that they were used to before. So every time we need to include mental health uh, activities or awareness within our practices, with our education system, let's talk about COVID-19, let's look at how do we cope. Again, I say this, we probably will be with COVID-19 for a long time. So the more we get to the acceptance phase of the virus is here, how do we just change uh, our lifestyles as much as possible to cope with it, the better towards getting into a space where we are now accepting uh, our situation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chari, uh, for the wonderful uh, uh, reaction. I would like at this point uh, to revert to our captain, uh, Mrs. Jacqueline Mugo, to take over and uh, proceed. Uh, welcome, Iji. Thank you very much, Moses, and for declaring me a captain. I was never good in anything near science or piloting. But I'm always amazed by how fast time goes. And I just want to give each of our panelists one minute to say a final word, starting with Kwame, then Mike, then I'll finish with Dr. Tari, uh, because I know there may be some things you wanted to say that you couldn't, and Kwame has to log off at 11.30 sharp, which is when we should finish anyway. So Kwame, what would be your final word there's someone who was asking about learning from other countries in Africa in terms of collaboration and getting help from them in borrowing what they are doing, countries such as Rwanda, South Africa, Senegal. Uh, but this same question I had posed to Dr. Wala in terms of why aren't we able to test as much as these countries are doing. But over to you, Kwame, for your final word. Okay, thanks. I think two things that we could do. One of them is, yes, um, um, we have to scale up testing. Now, testing doesn't necessarily, it doesn't necessarily mean it has to be done in, in country. Uh, so for instance, if the government wanted to ramp up testing, we know in West Africa, some countries are actually sending their tests to Senegal, which has a cheaper and established systems for testing. We could do that. Uh, the UK as well last week sent 200,000 samples. 
to the US because their own labor laboratories had some problems. So that can happen. So my view is we need to find solutions around this. We cannot sit on our hands and claim that. Testing is imperative in, in, in my view, whatever else it, uh, we do. The second part is the reason testing is essential is because as we've accepted, we are going to be living with this um, pathogen for a while and it might come in cycles or not, I hope it doesn't. But what that means is that every moment we need to be able to find out how far it is gone. So whether we can scale back the, 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 the measures that are being taken or actually we can allow for more phased opening because phased opening is what it has to be. Understand that this damage that's being done structurally to the economy and the confidence that business people want is to be able to say that if I'm required to test my people, it's affordable, it's efficient, and those costs can be taken in very quickly. And then when I can open, I'm sure that I can open and be confident that my, my clients would come in. So I still I think that as someone asked if the president was here, what would I tell him? I would tell him, make sure you have a plan. If you cannot ramp up our testing to take 40,000 because cartridges are not available or something else, put those tests in, a, in, a, in an envelope, send them over to Rwanda or somebody else who can test them on our behalf and then send them back uh, a couple of days later so that we can. Without testing, to be honest, we'd be flying blind. And that's a very dangerous thing to do. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kwame. Uh, nothing to add there. You're very clear. It's about testing and we need to do everything possible to do that. It's been wonderful having you in this webinar. We look forward to engagement with you. Uh, I know you have to run away. So have a very good day. And thank you for your insights. Bye, Harry. Mike, your final word. Uh, thank you, Jackie. Uh, I think I forgot to mention that uh, we have, as part of our partnership with the Ministry of Health, uh, the government has agreed to subsidize uh, this test. Uh, and uh, hospitality, uh, restaurants, uh, pubs, and uh, retailers will be tested for only a thousand shillings. Uh, so the rest of the cost is being borne by the government. Now, uh, this is a very, very good move, and uh, we, we, we highly appreciate uh, uh, that decision by, by government. Uh, but as I said before, we are trying to find ways of, uh, of reducing uh, the crowding. In fact, as we were talking, I, I saw some two messages from some of our members they would like to offer their facilities, so they want us to know how to go about it. Uh, and I'll be getting back to them uh, to, to show them uh, uh, what we need to do uh, before the tests are actually conducted. Uh, I, I think we are, we are living in uh, extraordinary times, as somebody said. Uh, we need to take uh, extraordinary measures, and we need to take extraordinary decisions. So if we do need to test and that's, that's a requirement, then let's take an extraordinary decision. Uh, if we do need to go back to business because uh, uh, you also want to avoid a social situation where, where crime has spiked and, and where other issues are coming up and uh, mental health issues, uh, we do need to find a way of really getting back to business. Thank you very much, Jackie, and thanks for being here. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Mike. We need to find a way of getting back to business safely. And finally, uh, Dr. Wala, your final word to us. Yeah, thank you very much. And I've seen all um, as people asking for the slides. I will share it to the FKE team who will share it out. Um, for me, it is just to say that the war is not won. I do reiterate the call by the Ministry of Health. I think people have uh, started slowly going back to work. I want to say that we are putting ourselves at jeopardy if we don't observe the containment measures. Let us learn to be innovative, I think, um, to the best that we can. Uh, let us also support um, people in the other socioeconomic status who may not be in a position in which they can afford to stay at home because they need to go to work. So push for those policy measures that need to be in place. Give your feedback to the stakeholders. Get involved. I think you and I, in our various capaci capacities or circles of influence, we are able to give feedback. We are able to um, basically pull our weight. But overall, let's be careful that um, uh, the low number of cases that we're seeing is not an indication that we have flattened the curve. But I think as Kwame has mentioned, 
our testing capacity is not uh, the place where we need it to be. So we are not celebrating as yet. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Walla. We are coming to a close now. Um, what has been a very stimulating conversation. And let me just start uh, to, by saying thank you very much to our three panelists for taking time to come and be with us, either virtually or in Mike's case, physically, because this is his second home, and for sharing your ideas. And for us, the takeouts are that as a country, we don't yet have adequate statistics to inform our decisions on reopening. So we need to accelerate testing. All the three panelists have emphasized that. Our capacity for testing is low. We need to do everything possible. If it cannot be done in country, then there's a possibility of doing that externally and ramping up testing so that we can know the level of infections and make decisions on when it would be safe to resume work. As Dr. Weller said, we are in the high infection uh, category as at now. So the restrictions which are in place are very well uh, needed and we do not need to rush to reopen. Some of the sectors have been more hard hit than others, others as Mike was saying, but uh, the whole economy has been hit and the projections on growth drastically reduced from 6.1% to about 2%, which is concerning. There will be need for innovation and revamping products and services because the situation will not be the same. We have to do confidence building and trust building amongst the population in, in our customers, clients, uh, to be able to resume work eventually because all the measures we're taking now to enhance safety are important, but they are having and will have lasting impacts on how we relate. There's the psychosocial, the mental health aspect, the need to invest in that, and in fact, investing in health and safety as a whole, so that workplaces are safe places and everywhere we are uh, is safe, and that is the idea. So safety is still a key priority. In terms of considering a safe return to work, um, caution is called for. A phased approach, gradual approach is called for. It cannot be done suddenly. Uh, that's also what we've had. There will be need for training, skilling and reskilling of employees for some to resume work and for some to do different things because this is also an opportunity for us to rethink. The element of local solutions uh, is, is emphasized, but at the same time, learning from others who are able to test faster than we are doing, such as Rwanda, South Africa, what are they doing that we're not doing and how can we learn? Uh, from them in terms of best practices. We are committed as a federation to keep providing these platforms for exchange of views um, with you as members and as friends of the federation. Today we had very many doctors participating, which is good. We actually opened up the forum to even non-members of the federation. So we are welcoming all non-members on this platform. Please feel free to join our membership. Our membership is open to all businesses registered in this country unless there's mainstream civil service or the disciplined forces. Whether you're a law firm, you're a cooperative, a private company, they are all welcome. So this is important. And the other thing we want to say and promise to do is to develop a toolkit for employers to use in making decisions and assessments of the readiness, the state of readiness of your enterprises as we prepare for work. We must use this time to prepare for resumption of work because it will happen. And we think this tool will be very useful to you going forward. I also want to thank all the staff of FK who've done the work behind uh, the scenes and are here in the webinar. And to you all, I wish you a very good week and we'll see you next week in our next conversation. Thank you very much for your participation. For now, from us here at the Federation, it's goodbye.